Are you into tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, and Monster of the Week? Sweet. Roll with me. Welcome to Roll With Me. My name is Michael, and I have been absolutely fascinated with tabletop role-playing games for the better part of my life. It is a borderline obsession. Perhaps I should see someone about it. I will not. Today we are going to talk about what is, in my opinion, perhaps the most exceedingly important aspect of running a game for your players. Before we get into it, I'd like to take a minute and introduce my sponsors for this episode. First up, Jetpack Comics and Games in Rochester, New Hampshire is by far the coolest comic book shop that I have ever set foot into. And guys, I have been in a lot of comic book shops. A lot of them. Jetpack Comics has everything from action figures to collectibles to vinyl pop figures to comic books and graphic novels and gaming accessories and Dungeons and Dragon modules and literally everything you could ever possibly want out of the coolest comic book mega store in the world. They're just awesome. Give them a call at 603-330-X-MEN or check them out at jetpackcomics.com. Jetpack Comics also happens to carry a line of custom dice boxes made by me at Mossfoot Customs, my other sponsor. Is it a sponsor if it's me, if it's Mike, if I'm making them, is it a sponsor? Anyway, look at this thing. I made this with my hands out of wood. It is wooden and it holds a full polyhedral dice set that's gonna fall out of here and into the roller. Every single one of them is imprinted or engraved with a different Dungeons and Dragons class, or you can order custom ones. They all come with different kinds of wood and genuine leather, and it's all Forestry Stewardship Council certified because I like the earth. So give us a call at Mossfoot Customs. Check us out at www.mossfootcustoms.com. Hit me up on Instagram, at Mossfoot Customs, and Facebook.com slash Mossfoot Customs. That's it. That's the one. All right. So let's get into the real meat and potatoes of the episode. Well, not meat. I don't eat meat. I'm a vegan. Although I guess if it was Dungeons and Dragons, then there would be mutton. Well, no, there's probably vegans in Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, I bet druids are vegans. Druids are probably vegans because, you know, they turn into animals. But they turn into animals that eat other animals. So maybe they're not vegan and meat and everybody likes potatoes. Let's get to the real potatoes of the episode. In this episode, we're going to cover player immersion, getting the people around your table into the game, into the story, into the world of Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder. This can apply to any tabletop role-playing game, every tabletop role-playing game. It is exceedingly important to get your players into the game. Otherwise, where's the fun? Now, I am admittedly no expert in Dungeons and Dragons. I have put in lots of hours and lots of game time and lots of research time into the world of tabletop role-playing games, but I am not a sage. I just have some advice I think might be useful. So here are my top three ways to improve your game in immersion. Top three ways to improve the immersion in your game. Number one is the simplest adjustment you can make to your game. It's very minor. It's adding sensory effects, right? A lot of DMs already do this, and I'll explain a little more. If you're playing a video game, and uh, let's say you're playing Skyrim, and you're hiking through the mountains, right? You hear the wind blowing, and there's soft music in the background when you encounter some sort of... Uh, 
goblin or there's not goblins in Skyrim. What the fuck is in Skyrim? Fucking ice trolls. Ice trolls. It's ice trolls. There's ice trolls in Skyrim. They do the whole like Luke Skywalker bit where it's supposed to be like a wampa. And right. Anyway. So ice troll comes running at you. Right. And all of a sudden the music picks up and the wind picks up. Right. And it becomes a more epic and intense moment. And if you're level 50 or whatever, then it doesn't matter because you can just swing your stupid ebony master crafted dragon flaming sword of poisoning doom and destroy the thing in one hit but still the point is this epicness this feeling of of battle and and urgency approaches with the music and this is something that we can very easily apply to our tabletop role-playing games simply by pulling up a laptop opening up youtube and turning on some epic battle you can literally search epic battle music right for your combats or you can search like fantasy walking music it's so so easy to put it in you put in some some ambient noises let's say you're uh, you're on the coast and so we put up some some sounds of of rolling tides right a, a storm is coming in we put in the sound of a thunderstorm there's all sorts of asmr tracks and all sorts of things all over the shithole that is youtube right there are some beautiful gems of of fantasy music and background soundscapes right this is something that will help move our players deeper into the story, deeper into the world that we're playing in, because if there are sensory effects around them that make them feel like they're on a ship or in the cold, misty mountains, right, then their characters are going to start acting accordingly. Now, you can even use music to suggest the time of day in your adventure. You start off and you've got some ambient noises of birds chirping and a bustling town. And as you head off, you're using this light, frivolous, frolicking, fancy F-word music. And everybody is enjoying their morning and on a jaunty saunter out of the town onto towards their next adventure. And as you enter a... a misty and creepy wood as the day goes by you can subtly shift that music over from our jaunty traveling music to something a little more morose something a little more soft and sad maybe a little suspenseful right as we're walking through this misty misty wood and we hear this ambient noise this sound of of sadness and wailing and Oh, suddenly it's spooky. Suddenly we're in a gothic campaign, right? And then, who knows, a monster erupts from the bushes and attacks in the darkness, right? And then we switch to our battle music and everybody rolls for initiative. What we are doing here is effectively taking our players and pulling them deeper and deeper into the world by substituting the sense of sight, right, with the sense of hearing. Uh, you may have noticed that in Dungeons & Dragons, we are a little underserved with visual representations of our game. Sure, there's miniatures and maps and pictures in the book, but much of Dungeons & Dragons or any other tabletop role-playing game is theater of the mind. This is brought about, and we'll talk a little bit more in the next segment, but this is brought about through all sorts of different senses. If we can't see what's happening, we're not playing the video game, we're not watching the movie, we have to come up with what it looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like, what it smells like in our head, right? And we can, as dungeon masters, we can add to this, right? We can, we can sort of f shift the focus of our players, right, from the kitchen table and the Mountain Dew that's sitting there next to the Fritos, right, into this dark, dank cave, or into the misty wood, or into this deep dungeon and dwarven ruins, and a lot of alliteration in this episode. Sorry, I was just burning some sage and botanicals because my party happened to walk into an apothecary. Number two might be a little more difficult to grasp, but is still a fairly simple concept. Now, too often have I been playing in a game, and my party enters a situation, and the dungeon master describes something like this. You are in the woods, 
and there is a monster. What do you do? So this is slightly problematic for a couple of reasons. First of all, what do the woods look like? Are the trees healthy or dying? Is it daytime? Is it nighttime? What is the ground like? Is there lots of grass, leaves, twigs, acorns, rocks? What are my surroundings? What does the monster look like? What is any of this? Could you please describe anything to me? Now we can get to the root of this problem fairly easily by just using a little more flowery descriptive language. As the DM, it is your job to facilitate the scene, to allow your characters, your players, to build the story in a world that you're all creating together. And it becomes very difficult for them to do this without any sort of nudges in the right direction. We really want to fill out the scene, really pull our characters into it, make the threats seem threatening, the dangers seem dangerous, right? And that makes the joy and the fun all much more joyous and fun! And so I encourage my DMs to try something a little more along the lines of this. Night falls as you make your long and arduous journey through the dense forest towards civilization. A deathly silent chill hangs in the air. The crackling and crunching of twigs and leaves beneath your boots echoes between the gnarled, twisted trees lining the thicket. As you move aside the brush, crusting a small hill, you see about fifty feet ahead a massive winged beast, its toothy maw clamped around the neck of a draft horse, limp in its monstrous clutches. So in that flowery little verse there, I laid out for the party what time of day it is, uh, what the temperature is like, uh, the, the sort of atmosphere of the forest, some clues as to what this monster might be, how far away the monster is, right? All of these pieces of information that are crucial for our adventurers to, to know and understand before they make their next move. There is a monster, it is scary, and what are you going to do? Just doesn't cut it, and unfortunately so many DMs fall into the trap of, well, it's not written in the module, so I don't really know what to say about it. And it is okay if you are a little over-descriptive, if you give away a little too much, maybe. I would... As a player, I would much prefer to be given too much information than not enough to know how to proceed with the encounter. I mean, I need to know generally what the monster looks like. I need to know generally how far away it is. I need to know if it's noticed me yet. I need to know uh, what kind of uh, surroundings I have, what kind of cover perhaps I could find. Tactical advantages come from description. Unless you have a beautiful 3D massive dwarven forge map, right, for all of your encounters that you're ever going to play, I mean, you got to give me something, right? Gotta give your party some descriptive words, some flowery language. It will help bring the characters, or bring the players, for that matter, into their characters and and give them sort of this, this impetus to to act. <laughs> Number three is admittedly a little more difficult uh, and requires a little bit more creativity and critical thinking and some research, perhaps. Uh, but the way that I like to immerse my my players into into the characters that I create, the NPCs that I introduce, is through sort of a codex of accents and dialects. Here's what I mean. I have always found it exceedingly difficult to come up with on the spot these personalities for NPCs when let's say my party comes to town and they want to go to a shop. Of course I could always do the well bring up the shop menu, open up the Dungeon Master's Guide or the Player's Handbook and look at the table of of armor and weapons and how much things cost and I can just handle that kind of dirty laundry out of game. But, if we're talking about immersion, I like to create a shopkeeper, and every single person in the world of Dungeons & Dragons, or Pathfinder, or Monster of the Week, or, or whatever you're playing, every single person has their own unique personality. So, to help me along with that for on-the-spot character creation, I apply my Codex of Dialects for races 
in my NPCs. For instance, um, I assign a proper British accent to to elves, high elves, uh, typically a more refined and dignified race, uh, who speak with a more refined and dignified dialect. Meanwhile, my uh, meanwhile the dwarves are a very proud and and bolstered race. I, uh, I give uh, some Scottish accents to them, assign a more uh, uh, brave and uh, sort of nothing to prove accent for the dwarves, right? And and you can see there's already a character forming there um, when when we apply these accents. If you're if you're looking at a halfling, I, I often give them a nice Irish lilt, right? It it brings their voice up, and uh, for some reason I like to give my gnomes a French accent. Uh, they are delicate and romantic. Uh, often you find uh, the gnome bards, and they play their little concertinos and violes, oui? uh Tieflings, I, I uh, assign with sort of a uh, like a Spanish or a, or an Italian kind of affect to the accent. Um, but the way that I assign these dialects, and you certainly don't have to follow the same codex, right? Uh, is I, I, I think of what the what the race sort of stereotypes are. Yeah, I know, racist, but, 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 uh, you know, you look at orcs, um, and, and just the physical build of an orc, they often have this massive underbite with these big, these big tusk teeth, right? So I, I like to, to give them a, a, a thick, heavy cockney accent, and I, I physically pull my jaw out to mimic what the underbite might manifest as, right? Um, and uh, some some of mine are a little more obscure, like my giants. I always give a Yorkshire accent, a bit of a, a bit of a an older um, and uh, and more unique kind of uh, kind of accent. You know, these giant springers of doom. You know, um, the uh, sort of the some of the first creatures on the earth, some of the first sentient creatures on the earth, uh, and so on and so forth. It, it just makes it so much easier for me to create a personality on the spot, right? Um, whereas instead of, you know, sitting down and planning and writing out all the NPCs that they may meet and assigning personality traits to all of them, it takes a lot of time and it's a lot of effort for something that may never come up in game. And so this, this sort of table of accents and dialects um, gives me uh, a very quick uh, sort of off-the-cuff character creation, if you will, um, where they walk into a, a you know, a, a, a tavern run by a, a short, stocky dwarf. I always fall back to the dwarves because they're probably my favorite, even though I never play them. But uh, you can hear, I mean, the the accent already gives something to the character, and it separates every other character that they're going to meet in the game, or every other race of character, at least, that they're ever going to meet in the game. You know, they could walk into a town and meet an elf, an orc, uh, a dwarf, a halfling, and a gnome, hear all of these different accents, and then be able to pick out who they're talking to based on how I'm speaking for the NPC. So to sum all of this up, I'm going to give an example of a description as your party comes across something entering an encounter. And I'm going to give a couple of different ways to approach this, right? The first being the sort of flat DM trap, no music, no effects, nothing, uh, no flowery language, just telling it like it is. Uh, and then the other sort of how I would prefer to see it and hear it and feel it as a player. When you get to the top of the hill on the coastline, you see a dwarf in the distance fighting some gnolls. He turns to you and says, hey, help me. Now there's a little bit there, but I'm not really inspired. Let's try this one. The sounds of metallic clanging grow louder and louder as you crest the top of the dune. From your vantage point, down the rocky coast, you can see about 30 feet ahead of you, a dwarf wielding two hand axes, locked in combat with a pack of gnolls, six or seven from what you can make out. He takes a moment, noticing your presence, and shouts at you, Well, are you just gonna stand there, or are you gonna come lend a sword? So there are some major differences between the two descriptions of this encounter. The second one gives us a little more 
Well, the second one gives us a lot more. We have this the sounds of the tide coming in. We have this this epic music starting to starting to pump up, right? And we and we have this this descriptive language of the, the clanging of metal, right? We're hearing his axes lock against the swords of the gnolls, right? We know how many gnolls there are, right? And when the dwarf turns to the party and yells at them, it's not just some random NPC saying, hey, help me. We're now getting a little insight into the personality of the character. Now, this dwarf may survive this fight with the gnolls or not, and if he does, well, then they already have an idea of the personality, and if he doesn't, well, then they had an idea of the personality of the person that just got killed by a bunch of gnolls, and that might affect your party in a certain way, depending on their, well, depending on their alignment, I suppose. All in all, if you're having any sort of trouble getting your players into the game that you're trying to run, or or you just want to add some more ambiance to your game, well, then following these three little tips and tricks, they're going to add so, so much to your game. You can, you can really create an immersive atmosphere that's going to pull your players into playing into the fun of Dungeons and Dragons, into the mythos, into the lore, the more they feel part of the world, the more, fuck it, the more we feel a part of the world, the more we feel a part of something bigger. And that's huge. Even if we are just sitting around a table eating Fritos, drinking Mountain Dew and rolling dice. Well, that's all I've got today. Thank you so much for watching if you're on YouTube. Thank you for listening if you're on a podcast streaming service. Uh, Please rate, subscribe, like, share this to all of your friends uh, if you think that they might benefit from some tips and tricks on how to DM a little bit better or how to play a character a little bit better. There's some fun stuff in here for players as well. Uh, again, check out Jetpack Comics in Rochester, New Hampshire, and check out my website, www.mossfootcustoms.com, for all of your custom handmade wooden and cool dungeons and dragons and pathfinder and monster of the week and lasers and feelings and all those games all the just all of them just the accessories just come get the accessories buy the merch